Preservationists and other specialists assure the authenticity of historic building materials, but that alone does not ensure structural stability. The responsibility of looking at the structural integrity and strength of these materials falls upon the structural engineer. Especially in historic structures, catastrophic failure is very possible, making structural engineering a matter of life safety. The upper Midwest milling industry in Minneapolis began to take hold in the early 19th century. Various large milling facilities began to pop up near the Mississippi River's St. Anthony Falls. The mills utilized the falls as a cheap natural source of energy. During its peak in 1916, the Minneapolis milling industry was the largest flour producer in the world. The area housed mills belonging to corporations as large as General Mills and Pillsbury. In 1881, the Pillsbury Company finished construction of AMO. Pillsbury AMO was the world's largest and most advanced facility of its kind. In its prime, the mill boasted an average of 17,500 barrels of flour a day. A mill's high productivity was made possible by water power provided by the falls. The water ran through a tunnel system to turbine pits, where the turbine energy was transferred to the mill equipment. Early on, A mill experienced some structural concerns. The flour milling process required a variety of heavy machinery, including sifting equipment. The soft limestone and lumber used on the exterior could not resist the constant vibration and the front facade began to bow. In the early 1900s, structural steel replaced timber framing in order to counter any further facade displacement. Pillsbury A Mill was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1966. It was determined to have an industrial era of significance for the period of 1800 to 1899. In addition, the St. Anthony Falls Historic District, where the mill is located, was listed in 1971. The mill remained under Pillsbury control and in operation until it was sold to a developer in 2003. The developer planned to turn the large complex into luxury housing. However, a lack of funding halted any progress and the facility began to deteriorate. It sat idle until 2010 when it was purchased by Dominium, one of the largest affordable housing developers in the United States. Dominion hired BKB Group, an architecture design and engineering firm. Together, they formed a plan to convert the mill into 251 affordable live and work artist lofts. The development was 65% funded by affordable housing and state and federal historic tax credits. Because of the historic tax credits, the construction plans needed to be approved by the National Park Service and Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office. There was also oversight from the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. Because it was first constructed in 1881, the mill had substandard insulation, heating, and waterproofing. John Stark, a BKV Group project architect, talks about how these problems were amplified with the function change from mill to residential complex. It was an industrial, probably was never heated to 70 degrees uh, on the inside in the wintertime. Um, and by adding insulation on the, that wall and red clay tile, that type of thing, it changes the way a building performs. Insulation and waterproofing mechanisms needed to be added to the exterior walls, windows, and parapets. It was a complex issue to regulate moisture and air in such an old building, so the placement of vapor barriers, thermal bridges, and brakes were carefully planned. There were various structural challenges throughout the project. The most visible was stabilizing the front limestone facade. The front bow wall was almost three feet back. It's really cool when you're first five stories up on the outside of the building looking across and you really notice it then. Um, that had been modified in 1912 and Cap Turner's firm had done that work and stabilized it. But um, when you look at it on the inside, you saw steel that was just barely holding up joists that had pulled away from the wall six inches. Although the mill did not have steel bracing during its period of significance, the National Park Service determined that a bracing system was necessary to ensure occupant safety. Structural analysis of a new system began with laser scans to assess the alignment of the front facade. The data was used by the structural engineers to model and design a solution. The first floor was rebuilt to add an appropriate amount of shear resistance, and a steel frame was erected on the inside of the limestone wall, with cross bracing spanning one bay. Engineers also had to analyze the tunnels. The system needed to be adapted for a hydroelectric generator. Structural and geoengineers worked together to ensure the stability of the masonry arches and surrounding soil. During ex excavation, you always run into structural things. Um, we found an area in the rail corridor where we wanted to put an elevator. There were some big piers, and we knew the slab was kind of rotted. 
and we had to put precast on top of it. But we didn't know those piers weren't sitting on footings. So as we're digging for the elevator pitch, we suddenly realized there's no footings, they're just sitting on the ground, very 20 feet from the ground, and they could tip. And so we stabilized it with the uh, precast and found a way to work around it, make it work, but it was just an unknown. Amil Lofts is not the only project where engineering played a pivotal role. Structural engineers fulfill a wide variety of duties in the preservation field. In Frank Lloyd Wright's iconic Falling Water, one of the concrete cantilevers was experiencing large deflections. In 1995, during a preservation effort, testing was conducted showing a lack of reinforcing steel. The structural engineers decided to install a post-tension system to correct the issue. Soon after, in 1999, a project was proposed to preserve the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, which was constructed in 1872. To protect the landmark from approaching erosion, the lighthouse needed to be relocated 3,000 feet inland. Engineers were the key players in planning the lifting, transportation, and permanent support of this 208-foot-tall masonry tower. There are countless examples of structural engineering and preservation. Structural engineers fix existing structural problems, but they also help to prevent life-threatening catastrophes. Engineers protect our history by ensuring that preservation efforts don't end up as rubble. In 2011, the National Trust for Historic Preservation listed Pillsbury Amill as one of the nation's 11 most endangered places. Thanks to the engineers and all others involved, we were able to save a valuable piece of our history.